Hey all you crazy cats, this is the Fan Film Podcast, this is episode 40, we're on March 28th, 2009. Beheadings, disembowelments, impalements, it sounds like my Friday night. These are just legends. The Falcon is simply a rare antiquity. It's been stolen! And we will introduce Mr. James Watson from Atlanta Studios. And um, particularly, we're going to talk about his fan film, Paul Apparel, starring our favorite hottie. <laughs> Valerie Perez. Oh, yeah. Right. You flirt. Uh, she's dreamy. <laughs> well, you know. You want to start from the the uh, the beginning there, James, how you got Atlantis uh, Studios going? How you got into the whole comic book game? Um, yeah, Atlantis Studios um, was actually created about uh, 10 years ago. Um, my background, uh, I worked in the late 80s and early 90s in animation, did animation layouts and production, and... Um, in the early 90s, uh, we began a small company called Newcomers Publishing, which published a lot of new and up-and-coming comic books talent. <clears throat> and uh, what we found was, uh, you know, uh, as you probably know, in, in comics, uh, the cha- challenges of finding good distribution and, you know, uh, selling profitably a successful series of comics is pretty tough. Um, there's all kinds of obstacles to that. So <clears throat> about 1997, we decided that... Uh, we would uh, kind of switch focus a little bit and use all the talent that we'd start to collect and start to do, uh, rather than be a publisher distributor, move Atlanta Studios into being uh, a company that provided a service, which was to create, uh, you know, great comics, graphic novels right. for paying clients. So basically, a work for hire studio uh, to to build comics uh, for people, either publishers or people in the entertainment industry who want comics. Know, developed for their properties. So um, <clears throat> I guess what makes uh, the studio unique is that we actually, very little of our work is actually uh, done for for publication in uh, direct publication to the comic book market. It's uh, Most of it is done as real concept work, uh, work for everything from advertising to film production companies to, you know, storyboards to that kind of thing. A lot of our work is... Uh, um, you know, is done for people in the entertainment industry. However, you know, my first love is comics. You know, I, 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 I grew up reading comics and writing comics and drawing comics, and I just, uh, you know, if I can get my hands on a good comic book property, I just love to, to do it. And we're involved at any point. We probably have about 20 or so comics graphic novels in production at any time, uh, one of which is Paul Apparel, but right. Paul Apparel is a comic book series we do for fun, and we do that the uh, you know, it is a property we own and something we, we just love to do just for fun. So, and that's your baby. You created that, correct? Yep, I did. Uh, I, I created it basically. Um, the actual first issue script was written uh, almost 10 years ago. Uh, at the time, we were publishing a uh, kind of a <clears throat> action-packed uh, satire series called Kelly Bell, Police Detective. And it was not a big hit. You know, we sold a few thousand copies. But while we were doing that... Um, one of the partners that I was working with on it, Rob Ewing, and I came up with an idea for, you know, let's, let's put together a, a story with an investigative reporter rather than, a you know, an action cop type of story. And uh, that story about the investigative reporter eventually became what is issue one of Paul Apparel, which was published and uh, first printed in February of 2006. Is so, that still available? Uh, which one? Uh, I'd definitely be interested. The uh, the first printing of uh, the first appearance of Paul Apparel, that'd be great to check out. Uh, yeah, well, obviously we have the comic. The first printing was sold out. Oh, so okay. I, I was going to say it's a. <laughs> all I have, all I have in the garage uh, is uh, is the second printing of issue one. So oh, if you okay. get the first printing of it. I'm sure you can. Uh, um, It'd be interesting to check it out either way. I'd take a six printing <laughs> just to uh, just to check it out. Would be pretty uh, pretty cool. I'd like to see the roots of the character. You know. Well, if you read issue one, you're actually seeing a script that was written almost ten years ago, but which was updated and then, and then the art was finished and we added a second story. Every 
every issue of Paul Apparel it has two stories in it. It has a, a big story, a main story, kind of an A story, which uh-huh. is 24 pages, and it has a B story, which is eight pages. And um, the B story was added uh, in 2006, but the A story actually is based on a script that was developed in 1990, 1998. Uh, now that we're kind of like on this, I was actually going to ask you, um, could you tell us uh, about some of the influences that uh, – about Paula's creation, like who influenced her? Or did, you, did you base her on anybody that maybe somebody you know personally, or is it based on any other characters? Maybe you got it, kind of like a pulpy noir feel going to. I noticed. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's absolutely a mix of your cliffhanger adventure, your pulp mystery, and your your Nancy Drew all kind of drawn into one. Um, except we want a much much hotter, much more attractive Nancy Drew. And <laughs> Uh, we want to uh, we want to put her in some you know more exciting perilous type you know adventures and that's where, right. where that's where we get this kind of Indiana Jones feel. I I said yeah we want to do a Nancy Drew type comic with a really hot heroine but let's make the action a little bit over the top. Let's uh, let's put a little Indiana Jones. Why not? Or, yeah, where it just gets you know just gets over the top. Um, I you know I, I, my favorite comics have never really been superhero comics. So right. the idea behind this is to create a, a heroine who's fighting in a in a world of you know, villains and supernatural mysteries, um, but has to rely on her wits and has to uh, you know rely on you know her her abilities to get out of it on her own, and uh, and to have a have a lot of fun with it that way. Um, we, we try for a very um, you know this is really an artist showcase comic. We wanted something that the artist could really love doing, and I, I can I tell you every artist that works on it right now our penciler is. Uh, his name is Wendell Cavalcanti, and uh, <clears throat> I, this is a fun comic to do because our style guide for the comic actually requires that almost every other page is a splash page. So uh, there you um, go. That's where you get to get loose with all the action. Yeah, exactly. So you got a page of exposition and some setup, and then a boom, an action panel, and then the next page. It just kind of builds that way. So if, as you look through the comics that I send you, you'll see. You know, really, you know, half the book is splash pages. It's a very visual style. More like, um, I guess, Danger Girl was a big influence. Jay Scott oh, okay. Campbell. Yeah, I, I, I remember that book a couple years back. That was the, uh, the uh, J. Scott Campbell, wasn't it? J. Scott Campbell, the original. I mean, very cinematic, very fun, very over-the-top action. If, if there's one comic book influence I'd love for Paul Farrell, I, I give to all the artists, it's that book. Um, you know, writing style, I mean, really what we want to do is want to recreate that spirit of the, the cliffhanger adventure, um, the, you know, impossibly beautiful heroine, incredible, incredible danger and peril, but um, at every issue is self-contained. So we don't, the actual, if you buy issue two, right. you're not going to be out of the loop. It's not like you have to buy issue three to find out what happens. Oh, I see. You can pick it up anywhere. It would be like issue 24, and you pick it, uh, pick it up and you're fine. Yeah, every story is self-contained, has a beginning, middle, and end. Uh, you know, we learn a little bit more about our characters in every story, but, you know, we uh, the one thing I always hated about comics as a kid was, <laughs> you know, I had to buy six issues of X-Men to pick yeah, it up. Yeah, yeah, pick it up on. next month. <laughs> you had and, to sit uh, there yeah. and wait. What's going to happen to Wolverine? You know, you had to sit there and wait. And I, I think, you know, in a world where, you know, you have to spend 3 or $4 just for one issue, um, that's not fair. So I know, uh, it's, it's very true. And so every adventure is self-contained, has its own little title, like the mystery of the haunted museum is issue two, and you know this kind of has that feeling to it. Just every every story has that kind of pulpy, you know, cliffhanger type story. Something you might see in a 1930s, you know, movie marquee or that kind of thing, or a Nancy Drew cover of an Nancy Drew book. So that's I guess that's the inspiration. Um, and uh, what's your printing schedule like? I mean, how many times? Do you get like an issue out once a year, couple couple each year? Yeah, pro- about a couple each yeah. year. Uh, right now, we have finished uh, all six issues, and this will be an exclusive information for your your listeners. Um, we have finished the first six issues, and really, that was our initial plan was to finish all six okay. and then see what the fans thought. So this year, um, the final uh, final two issues we have issue one through four now on sale. Issue five and six will be released this year. And, they, again, they, each of them has two stories. That's basically that's four new stories. Uh, we have a special anthology, which will come out probably in April or May, which is just a, a bunch of short stories. And um, then we'll kind of sit back and we'll look at the sales of the comic and make a decision about what we do next. Um, you know, distribution in the comic book channels is kind of a tough animal. So, yeah. Um, I know Mr. Mosier is in the trenches with that one. <laughs> yeah. Right? 
Yeah. James is well, way ahead of me. No, well, and so you understand that. Yeah. Um, basically, I, I have to operate as a businessman. I love doing this for fun, but I also have to be a businessman. You know, to, to print a comic and to produce a comic is several thousand dollars, really. So I have to make a decision about uh, this property is really taking off. People are buying the comics, but you know what? Make a lot more money, and we sell a lot more downloads of the movie than we ever do the comics. So wow. okay. um, I, we're going to have the comics. They're going to be published. We're going to sit back and see what people think. We, you know, we do sell every day. We have sales, people buying the comics all around the world, um, and we ship them out from here in Atlanta. But um, at some point I have to sit back and say, well, does it really make sense for us to keep doing comics? Another thought is to go next year in 2010 and produce maybe one graphic novel a year. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, the, so. the, the truth is there are so many more places to sell a bound book than there are to sell a comic book. That's the thing, too. That's right. There's more channels, and it's a, you know, if we, if we, if we do Paul Apparel as a graphic novel series where we put out one every year, then what you'll see is more of a cinematic feel. Each one that comes out will be like a movie release, but it'll be something that will never, you know, we'll always do something in the comics that we can't do, you know, in the movies, something that right. maybe, you know, a little more out, outrageous a little more sexy, a little more um, over the top, because you, you, know, you can get away with that. The budget is the same, whether you do something crazy or do something normal. So <laughs> we'll do something crazy, probably with the, with, the, with, the, uh, with the graphic novels. But we'll just have to wait and see. I mean, uh, I guess the, we hope people like the next few comics that are coming out. We hope people collect them. And, um, and if it, they sell well, then we will continue to do Paul Carroll comics. Next. Are you going to be coloring up the uh, graphic novels? Um, absolutely. Well, <laughs> Let me say this. Sure. <laughs> we we made purposely made a choice to go with the black and white format because we wanted that retro feel. Um, the graphic novels and, and, and you know another possible market is you know PDF downloads. Um, a lot of people are telling us that they want to have downloadable comics, <laughs> and both of those options, either graphic novel or downloadable comics, would actually allow us to do color and make probably make money at it. So. We will, you know, like I said, we'll make we'll make that choice. I want to see Paula in color. Uh, we we will probably test the waters a little bit with um, maybe one or two download comics in color and see what people think. Now you also um, did you have anything uh, going further there, Will? Uh, no, I'm actually okay. If you want to, oh. if you want to cut into something there. Yeah, I was going to say you also um, you. I don't know if you still produce it, but you did produce a uh, fan uh, magazine, if you will, uh, for uh, Tomb Raider, for Laura Croft. That's right. And um, we, we talked with Valley President Nick Murphy, actually, probably last year about this time. About, yeah, um, it was about a year ago. About their fan film, Tears of the Dragon. Now, you did a prequel um, uh, comic book ash can, if you will, for that film, and I'm assuming that's how you initially met up with Valerie. Did you want to... Yeah, well, let me, um, yeah, we do, and we actually do still work with our partner, Planet Lara. PlanetLara.com is actually our partner and the reason we produce the tales of Lara Croft fans. Yeah, that, that's a great website. It's, I, think it's, I think it's the best one out there. Oh, it definitely I, is, I'd say, easily. And uh, incredible traffic. Uh, Chris Ridgen actually is uh, the webmaster for Atlanta Studios. I uh, don't know if you know that, but he actually no. does and helps us design the websites for the Paul Barrel movies and the comics and all that. So oh, cool. There's a, there's a little bit of sharing of information back and forth. Um, but the Tales of Lara Croft fanzine was started actually back in 2004 because I'm a big Tomb Raider fan, big <laughs> Lara Croft fan. And, um, and the, the issue was there were so many... There were actually a lot of fan comics being created at the time, the early 2000s, and <clears throat> no place to publish them, no place for people to see them. So we, we approached IDOS, um, their legal department. We also, working with Chris, who, who knows the fan community, um, we said, you know, how would you feel about us? You know, basically, as a partner, uh, you'll produce a, uh, a fanzine of original comics based on Lara Croft. Um, we promised them that would be, uh, you know, all... You know, profits would go into just continuing to fund the operation. They could review, um, Idols Legal could uh, review each issue and um, you know, to make sure that we're not doing anything inappropriate with their character. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, at the same time, we knew Top Cow at the time was publishing a, a Tomb Raider comic book. So That's we right. Had to, yeah, so we positioned ourselves squarely in the fan community, the fans of, of, of Tomb Raider. And if you, if you know anything about that community, there's, you know, a lot of people that just write you know, Tomb Raider stories, people that just draw Tomb Raider art, and they do it with no, absolutely no place to put it. Make fan films. 
make fan films. <laughs> right. Again, yeah. I'll get to that in a second. But uh, yeah, they do all this stuff, and they actually because they love the character, so there's no place to put all this stuff that they do. And so, Tales of Lara Croft was just a place specifically where people could put um, comics and art um, based on Lara Croft. Now, one of the things we did in issue six of Tales of Lara Croft was, uh, you know, I started as I started to get into it and have a lot of fun with it. I, uh, I realized that people were making fan films. Three or four years ago, I, I probably didn't know too much about fan films. Um, but I, I saw uh, information about Valerie's film um, and uh, was intrigued by it and thought that that would make a great article, kind of like you guys, uh, as editors. Yeah, that's fans, a good I, story to be found there. <laughs> I said, there's a story here. Here are people yeah. that aren't creating a comic, but they're creating, they're putting all these resources, incredible amount of work. I mean, Nick and Valerie put an incredible amount of work into creating, you know, I don't know how long the film is, 40 minutes or something like that, uh, original film that they created, the, you know, everything about it. So in issue six of Tales of Lara Croft, there's actually a five or six page interview with them with some photos and information on the film. And that was the first time I actually spoke with Valerie and with Nick. And as I learned, as I talked with them, um, I think we both realized that there might be some opportunities here for, for us to go both ways. Um, Valerie uh, immediately, once she learned about Atlanta Studios, said that they wanted to create some kind of comic based on the film or kind of a prequel comic to the film. And so um, we actually did that um, for them. Uh, I don't even think I don't think we charged anything for it. I think we just did it as part of you know what we're doing with Tales of Lara Croft, kind of under there, because mm-hmm. um, they had a really good story, and so we produced that for them. So they could uh, distribute that at screenings of the movie and things like that, and um, and that got me out to San Diego Comic Con and some of the other places. So I met Valerie and and uh, you know saw what a comic book geek she was and uh, <laughs> and thought and from the, uh, we could talk about Paul Apparel in a minute. But the bottom line is that's kind of how we connected with that. Um, I, I think the uh, the prequel comic actually. If did you ever get a chance to look at it, either of you? Yeah, I do have a copy. Uh, yeah, I was actually. Collection. I think actually, yeah, it was it was uh, Valerie who sent it to me personally, along with the uh, along yeah, with the DVD. DVD. Yeah, yeah. So I think we both got that at the same time, Chris. Around yep. The, yep. I mean, that was an interesting thing because we actually tried to get Valerie's likeness uh, onto Lara Croft in the in the comic, and uh, of course she's on the cover. Right. And, um, and uh, we just had, you know, it was very easy to move that into our production process because some of the things we were doing with Tales of Lara Croft, we were actually taking people's scripts and we were illustrating them. I was, you know, any of the Atlanta Studios artists who were free or weren't doing anything or if there was some new artist that I wanted to test out, um, I'd say, yeah, would you be willing to do a Lara Croft story? Of course, everyone said, yeah, I'll do a Lara Croft story. So it's a great, it was a great way to get new and up-and-coming people kind of in the process and see, you know, if they could handle a, you know, a four-page or eight-page comic story. So... <laughs> At any rate, um, that's, that's how I first connected with them, and I, that's amazing what uh, Valerie did on that and, uh, and, and, and Nick. And uh, there's, also, there's also some real new exciting fan films. Uh, you know, Stephen Reynolds with Tomb Raider Ascension. Yep, Ascension's a great one. Uh, I think he'd be well worth interviewing. I've, I've talked with him quite a bit, really impressed with what he yeah, did. We talked to him um, about last year about this time as well. Okay, oh, good. Yep. And, and then... Um, I think I don't know if you know Tissane Vaudable in France. Um, uh, if you ever, you know, if you ever wanted to interview someone in France, but they're producing a Tomb Raider. Absolutely. Film right now. Yeah, we'd love. We talked to who? Who, who did we talk to? David. Uh, um, Mr. David Sario. Yeah, yeah, right. In France. Well, this will be. I don't know. Is that Will who said that? Or yeah. Okay. It was both uh, of I don't those know if you know this, but <laughs> Tiffane, Tiffane, who plays Lara Croft in that movie. Okay. She was actually an artist for several of the comic stories in Tales of Lara Croft. Oh, She's, cool. She's an incredible. She, she's an incredible, talent, very talented artist, and her her comic book art is, you know, as good looking as she is. I mean, it's a woman of many talents. <laughs> yeah, very very talented. And so, if you ever talk with her again, or you give them more, you know, exposure on, on their their film, you should ask her about her comic book work and what she drew for Tales of Lara Croft. Yeah, yeah we'll, 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 we'll look we're her always up. Always glad to you know uh, promote comic book work, especially the independent stuff. You know. Yeah, get out there. I, I think uh, if if there's a way we can, you know, promote more Tales of Lara Croft. We don't make any money off of Tales of Lara Croft. Right. The only purpose it serves us is uh, to give artists that are up and coming a place where they could, you know, draw something that's pretty exciting. And if you guys ever noticed, there's a there's a new one out. It's, uh, it's Tomb Tomb Raider Samaria. Have you seen that? No. 
It's a it's a foreign one. If you go to Fanboy Theater, uh, I believe you go to I believe it's in the trailer report section. Um, I put it there maybe two or three updates ago. I remember. So if you want to go check that out, you can check that out. Right. Uh, I believe it's German. I'm I'm trying to think if I remember it right, but I, I, I think it's that. interesting how these um, the Lara Croft lookalike models and, and and girls that dress up like her. Yeah, a lot of them are you know move into becoming models or actresses yeah. or doing these films. Um, that's you know Valerie, Tiffane. I mean, some of these the German models. I don't know who's in the movie, but there's quite a few of them. So certainly, certainly a lot of eye candy to look up. <laughs> You're right. But that was a good way to get attention for the film. They're trying to do a new uh, Hollywood version, I guess. Um, I don't know who would play, or maybe maybe like Megan Fox or something would play her. I don't know. Angelina is having too many kids. And, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the uh, Tomb Raider, the, I don't know what you would call it, the cra- craziness coming. <laughs> Hard to fit the twins in the backpack. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> throw, the, throw the kids in the bag and swing around on a rope. That's, that's what I want to see. Well, I noticed that talking with Stephen Reynolds, one of the real challenges, I mean, it's, it's, it's exciting and creative. These guys get involved in making the films, but one of the issues they have is they can, can never make any money at it. I mean, Valerie right. and Nick can't make any money at Tears of the Dragon. Uh, Stephen, incredibly talented producer, but, you know, it's, I've talked to him. It's frustrating for him, as you, I'm sure you talked to him, too, that you know, can't, can't really get distribution deals or really make back your costs on it. Paul Apparel is different in that Paul Apparel is, a, is your it, it's owned by our studio, and as we produce comics and films, you know, it can at least pay for itself you know, as we do it. Well, the is, thing Paul with, Apparel, uh, is Paul Apparel your top-selling character, would you say, in your Atlanta studios? Or? Yeah, it's, it's uh, in, the, in the, what is it, 10, 15 years I've been doing comics. Uh, I've never done anything that's sold as well as this. It's in, wow. You know, every issue sells out. Um, you know, people want to see more. We even... You know, the, the, the films, you know, Trapped in the Flames, which we produced uh, in 2007 with Valerie, is a, you know, you know, an ongoing seller. I mean, we sell, you know, <clears throat> lots of downloads every month for that, even though it's been almost two years since it was produced. Um, and and it, just, it just seems to be a character people have a lot of uh, attention for. I think there's things we can do better, and I, I'd like to do more to promote it, um, promote the series, promote the character. But, yeah, it's, as a comic... Yeah, you know, it's a solid seller. I wish we could just put out more comics because they would they would sell well. Um, the um, you know the the films again seem to be extremely popular. And Crystal Falcon, I'm starting to see the initial downloads. We actually launched it last Thursday, and uh, it's out selling almost four to one. Trapped in the Flames. So okay, sweet. It's a, it's a, I think that's a good sign that we'll probably be seeing more all apparel on film. But films just are just. There's more revenue and there's more profitability in making a short film if you can actually put them up for sale than than the comic. How about the cost of making? Is it is it cheaper to, to make a... I would imagine it'd be cheaper to make film than to hire an artist and an anchor and whatnot. Well, that's, that's an interesting question. I think it's, it's actually what drives so many... I mean, there are a couple of comic book studios... And including a big one, Marvel Studios, that are moving to making movies because the bottom line is, in some ways, it's almost cost about the same. Uh, we can produce we we produce Trapped in the Flames for about the cost of a full length feature, a full length full color comic book. Mm. So, so it's actually pretty comparable when you look at it. I mean, we're not creating Hollywood sized productions here. We're creating really fan film type things here. We put a little bit of money into props and special effects, and a lot of people work for free. Um, you guys know about that stuff. Yep. Um, but but the if you do, if you do that and you do real guerrilla filmmaking, you know you spend a few thousand dollars making the fan film the, the film, and it, that's about how much it costs to do a, com- yeah. a full color comic. A full color comic is probably about two or three thousand dollars to produce if if you pay everybody kind of standard rates and it's a thirty two page book. So. So to make a film and be able to sell it for the same amount, you kind of think, well, would I rather be making comics or do I want to make movies? <laughs> right. I wonder if it's, um, plus, I don't know. I'm sure a lot of kids do collect comics, but not like when we were kids. Uh, so it's probably more of a visual thing, so you probably get more of a spectrum as far as ages are concerned than um, what you would from selling your comic. I mean, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but just the way things work now visually, kids, you know, the video games, the movies and stuff, they're not into comics like they used to be. I think I think it's a different experience. I do think that 
there are there's, there's a big population that wants to read. They want to read their adventures. They love to read, and they love that that connection with print, and and that's that's there. Um, but but movies are something just universal. It's very and every every we've all grown up on movies. We all in television, and we all are very visual anyway. I I would say that a lot of our fans. You know, some of our uh, – I send, for example, I send out announcements to people who buy the comic to kind of promote the films. And there's some crossover, but a lot of people who buy the comic don't actually buy the movie. Right. They, they, uh, they just love the character as a comic book character. And, and it's – you know, there's more, there's more imagination there. And the film, film – the film answers all the questions. It tells you everything. It doesn't leave anything, you know, to, to think about, whereas a comic can be a lot more fun that way. So, And Valerie's in it, too. <laughs> Sorry, Valerie. Just 20 kidding. minutes looking at Valerie. And, yeah. Right. And in Crystal Falcon, you have two beautiful women. Mom yeah. yeah. I was actually going to ask about that character. Uh, it's kind of like uh, Paula's rival. Yeah, Paula's rival. She first appeared in the comic book in issue two, and she's been a regular character ever since. Her name is Veronica Villancourt. She is the society writer for the Big City Gazette, the Daily Gazette. And... Uh, She's extremely jealous of Paula because she was the big kahuna before Paula showed up. She was the one all the guys paid attention to. She was the one who got all the best headlines and stories. Um, and she was up, you know, she was wanted to be, you know, on the city desk. But Paula comes in out of nowhere with her connections and gets the, the prime role of being the investigative reporter for the, for the newspaper. And, of course, Veronica is extremely jealous. And uh, <clears throat> so... The, but the fact is, Veronica is just not quite as bright or quite as, um, I, I would say... Uh, the blonde hair. What's it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, no. Jeez. My girlfriend's going to beat your ass for that one, Chris. <laughs> I, I hope there's no one on the podcast listening who's blonde. But um, now, she, she's perhaps not as resourceful, I would say, and maybe not as imaginative and maybe not as uh, clued in to the dangers of this, this dark and dangerous world of the city in which they live in. And so uh, Veronica can be extremely ambitious, but she gets herself in a lot of trouble because she... And I was going to say, not to sound too kind of like, a, uh, I don't know, like maybe uh, crude, but she could really, for just like a female reporter, she could kick some ass. <laughs> She's out there just flipping guys over and... Grabbing knives and all kinds of wrestling snakes. Paula is Paula is Lara Croft in the city. She is, um, you know, she comes from a privileged background. She's had a lot of training in all kinds of uh, sports and athletics and self defense. And uh, you know, she looks gorgeous, but when she has to take care of herself, she's not. Uh, for her, it's not a. It's in her nature to be able to defend herself. Um, you, you know, it doesn't always work. But uh, in many cases, she's able to defend herself and uh, and to you know beat down the bad guys. And in the comics, she does it all the time. Um, Veronica, as her rival, doesn't have any of those skills. So <laughs> she relies mostly on her her ability to uh, uh, seduce the men she works with, or to um, perhaps uh, dazzle them with uh, the appearance of brilliance. <laughs> she's more of a, she's more of a hair puller. She she is she'll 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 be the one who wants <laughs> exactly and the, the two the two in the room together uh, it's it's a cat fight that's, that's you could you feel the tension and and Paula you know it's not Paula's fault it's mostly Veronica's fault Paula would just like to get the job done solve the mystery and get the bad guys but Veronica's there to trip her up every time she can now whose whose decision was it to get into um, to do the live action um, I mean. Is that something you were thinking about when you saw Valerie? Was it in your mind beforehand? Did Valerie see the comic and go, hey, we can do something live action with this? How did that work? <laughs> well, I, I think it had been turning around in my mind. Um, but the minute I saw photos of Valerie, actually the minute I saw photos, I think that's one thing, but I actually met her at San Diego Comic-Con 2006. She and I had, had a lot of conversations about her perhaps modeling for the character because I thought she was a great model for the character, beautiful brunette. Uh, attractive, um, a curvy, everything you'd need in the heroine. And she'd done some modeling for Adam Hughes, who lives here in Atlanta, as well as Mark Brooks and some other uh, comic book artists. And uh, so our first conversation was actually just uh, modeling. Say, so, okay, listen, um, you know, I think it'd make a, it'd be a lot of fun for artists to have a style guide, you know, with a model that kind of is, is dressed as a character so we could get 
you know, get all the artists on the same page and make them look good. But sure. Before Valerie came on board, we had actually kind of selected the actress Jennifer Connelly uh, as she was kind of in the 90s. Good uh, choice. As, as, as the model, kind of a very attractive brunette, um, you know, very, um, you know, adventurous and uh, kind of an I- iconic look, very classic Hollywood glamour, um, but, you know, very adventurous. And so that was our, it, our first style guide we created in 2006. That was the model. I said, just think about Jennifer Connelly. Here's some photos. Uh, let's make her. So if you look at the issue one cover, that's kind of what we drew from and, and where we went. But once I met Valerie, I said, well, here's someone who we could actually – we could actually pose, we could actually work with, we could actually try some different things, get a whole set, a set of photos we could put in our style guide. And um, <clears throat> that conversation led to, you know, talking about what, you know, she had finished up Tears of the Dragon, and that really wasn't, I mean, they were doing some things to get it released, but after that was released, there wasn't much more to that. So right. um, I approached her about, uh, it was my idea. I said, listen, you know, we're going to be putting out a few more comics in 2007. How about if we put out a, you know, a seven or ten minute movie short just to see if it would work. Let's see if the character would work on film. Uh, the, I, the character didn't require a lot of special effects uh, other than Valerie. She's a great... <laughs> <laughs> She's a great special effect. <laughs> great special effect. Um, <laughs> but, but she knew she knew how to do the fight scenes. She knew how to do some of the special effects. Uh, she'd work with explosives and things like that. And so I said, well, let's... Uh, Let's let's build a scenario um, that basically is a test of action and stunts and special effects. Let's put Paula here. So let's take this character. Let's let's do this like one of the short stories in Paula Carroll comics. Let's just create it from beginning to end. She meets her her nemesis, um, Anthony Carleone. Uh, he gets captured by the mobsters and put in a room, and we set it on fire. And so, you know, Valerie, yeah, we'll put you in a room, tie you up, and set the room on fire. And she says, "Great, I'd love to do that." <laughs> Uh, I got to get out to get this story out. So hey, I got to break out of these ropes. It's exactly there's uh, there are very few actresses uh, anywhere in 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 the world that I think would look at that and say yeah I really want to do that. But Valerie's one of those. And that's she's what, all into those pyrotechnical things. Yeah, anyway. I'm starting to get worried about her. Right? Uh, <laughs> Paul, you're starting to scare me, Valerie. <laughs> no, but she's incredibly talented and wanted to do it, and it was a lot of fun. Um, uh, the director on the on Trapped in the Flames was Bill McClelland, who had done a lot of. Uh, Glamour video and photos, and wanted to do you know an action short, so that hooked up well. And he brought with him some of his crew to edit and do sound. Um, that film was a little bit different than Crystal Falcon in that it was done entirely in Los Angeles. Uh, I'm of course here in Georgia, and so my role was more just consulting uh, executive. But I, I was I was very not really on the set, um, but a lot of decisions were made uh, with with Valerie working that and, and Bill. Um, you know, we made some decisions and conferences and things like that, but um, that was produced in the Los Angeles area and um, then edited and final sound and all that done uh, here in Atlanta. But um, <clears throat> it, it's, it's interesting because the locations and, the, and the, the explosives and everything that were, were <laughs> purchased for it were all, uh, all done in the Los Angeles area. And that, there's a whole bunch of stories we could tell about that, how difficult it is to get a location, especially if you say, uh, yeah, we'd like an old warehouse. Um, but by the way, we're actually going to you know, be lighting off some pyrotechnics and stuff. <laughs> Suddenly, if you're doing a low-budget film, uh, that could triple or quadruple your budget. Just, uh, just trying to get a place where you can light off a few fires and stuff. So uh, I, my hat is off to both Valerie and Bill McClellan, the director, for kind of making it happen and, and making it happen for the budgets they did. So, um, I, you know, I encourage everyone to, to download and look at it because it's a, a great little action short. And... It does set up. We we, um, we made a lot of decisions on that film that have really helped us since. Uh, everything we made, uh, we made costume decisions for Paula. We made the look and feel of Carleone. We uh, we've done some things with music. And and Will, it sounds like have you seen the Crystal Falcon? Uh, I actually got a chance to to check it out actually last night. Yeah, and Chris hasn't yet, so I really don't want to say anything. But it looks <laughs> it looks great. Okay. Well, I was just going to make a comment that the music composer for Crystal Falcon is the same as Trapped in the Flames. So, oh, really? We're composing actually original music for for the series. So, is that the stuff that's on the website as well? Uh, yes, exactly. Okay. The music that's on the website was composed by Johnny Griffin, who uh, is a friend of Valerie's, who was brought on as part of Trapped in the Flames. So, I'm just saying that the, we're doing a lot of original things. I don't know if there's a lot of comic book companies out there doing this type of stuff, um, but we're actually 
you know, we, we now have wardrobe for Paula uh, huh. with, with Valerie's help because she's, you know, great at costumes. We have, uh, uh, you know, a lot of the, uh, the music design, the graphic design of the films, and, you know, we hopefully will improve over time. But the, 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 the core is there. We, we use Trapped in the Flames to kind of set the stage for maybe doing more films, which it appears we're going to be able to do. So. You've got a list of them on your, uh, on your website, soon to come. Coming soon or something. Yeah, there are at least two more 20-minute yeah. uh, sh- uh, shorts that will be produced here in Atlanta. Um, the next film is called Invisible Evil, and uh, it will be produced, probably shot sometime uh, this summer here in Atlanta. Okay. Cool. And when would that be available for download? Well... Or you're not sure? When it's done, it's done. <laughs> you know, I, I personally would love to give a date, but my my experience on Crystal Falcon is that I have to be cautious about getting yeah. dates because post-production, to make something really work well, post-production uh, is difficult to um, quantify. But I would say that between the after we we wrap production, I'd love to have a film release three months after that. So okay. before Christmas in 2009, uh, Paula Peril and Visible Evil, we hope, will be out. Valerie is a good Christmas present. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, that would be be great to have that under have her under our Christmas tree. I know, right? You can mass produce her. <laughs> hey, you can tell a call after we're done with this conversation. <laughs> hey, you guys want to make a couple of dollars? <laughs> there hey, we go. Can you talk about, uh, I don't want to put you on the spot or anything, and I'm not sure what happened. Um, can you talk about Midnight in the, in the Darkest Hour? I know the experience probably wasn't all that great. Uh, um, sure. No, I saw that question on your list, and I thought, no, now is a good time to talk about that. Okay. Um, and so you can kind of have an exclusive, because I'm looking on the web, and I don't see very many people that actually – Understand what uh, what happened there, and and there and the you know, and what you know what was what was produced or not produced there. So um, <clears throat> basically, I'll, I'll keep it very simple. Uh, in the in in March of 2007, um, we were at the New York Comic Con, and you know showed for the first time Trapped in the Flames. And during the course of that convention, I was contacted by Andy Rodriguez, who runs a production company out in Arizona called New Phoenix Fillmore. Right. Uh, he had seen the info on Trapped in the Flames. He saw the saw Valerie, saw the uh, the character, and uh, and said that this is something he'd really see, he'd really like to produce as a feature. Uh, I, you know, I I had in my mind that uh, you know there there needed to be some way for us to get from where we were doing comics and short films to producing a feature, and what Andy proposed was to license the character. Okay, right. so he proposed to listen. I will give Atlanta Studios a flat licensing fee, and uh, you'll have approval over the screenplay. And if you approve that, then we'll move forward, and I'll produce the film, and you'll receive royalties based on the license. So okay. What makes Midnight is the Darkest Hour a different type of experience, and that is what the, I was as the the director of Atlanta Studios. I was not directly involved in production decisions not involved in, you know, decisions about who to hire for photography, editing, sound, all that stuff. Those decisions were all made, you know, by Andy Rodriguez, uh, casting decisions. I mean, we had some, there were a few few roles that we had casting, uh, or, you know, oversight, uh, you know, Paula, Jimmy, Veronica, the kind of the main characters that appear in the comic. Mm-hmm. I basically said I wanted to make sure I had approval for those. But other than that, I said, you know, as long as the screenplay you know, is a good match to the comic book and you treat the characters with respect and we keep the, the movie PG rated, which is kind of our standard for the Paul Apparel movies, I said, uh, you know, we, we can go for it. Um, <clears throat> and so it really it was produced as a, as a licensed production. It was, uh, uh, I was there kind of almost as a consultant. You know, Andy and I would talk on the phone when decisions came up. Would Paula do this? Would Paula do that? Would this happen in the series? You know, could we use this word? This, you know, whatever. Uh, and I, you know, we ba- I just basically consulted with it. And Andy, to his credit, um, is an incredible, incredibly resourceful director. He, he does an awful lot with very little. Um, and, but he's also, you know, he's got a lot of credentials. He's he's won an Emmy for his work at the Intermountain West, and he's. You know, extremely solid editor and um, had a, lot, a really good vision and still does have a good vision for the feature film. Um, and the script was very, very good. So I'm going to say all those things to his credit. Um, I, the problem was um, funding. And uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, I basically think there was just, you know, we're trying to produce a 90-minute film. 
on a very small budget. Um, again, it was his budget. I, you know, his decision, his right. budget. I didn't tell him any budget. I said, yeah, you know, produce it. I didn't care. You produce something for ten thousand or produce it for fifty thousand. Doesn't matter to me. Um, <clears throat> just make it, you know, good quality. And uh, basically, he just spent a lot of money. He shot about eighty um, percent of the movie, and um, and then basically funding ran out. Okay. Now, uh, I will say this. I have seen some footage, and there are some things that are, that are very, very strong. And there is some footage of Valerie, that, like the opening scene of Midnight is the Darkest Hour, is that basically it's a 10-minute action scene. And um, there's, there's hope. Both Valerie and I and even Andy hope that uh, that could be edited together and could possibly even be released sometime this year as a you know for sale download something along the lines of Trapped in the Flames. It's not a complete story, but it is kind of a standalone. It's kind of like the opening of a James Bond movie. Okay, right. right. Where you open, you yeah. see the character thrown into it's nothing over to the do top. usually with the rest of the the movie. Right, right. So it's an over the top perilous situation, and it reveals something about the character, but doesn't reveal too much of the story. And that's what's been shot. And there's some hope that that will be um, edited together. And I I told Andy if. Uh, and like again, if the quality's there and it's consistent with the comic and what we're trying to do with the series, then uh, I have no problem with him releasing it. Um, but it is completely his decision. It's okay. his uh, his license to produce Paul Apparel movies expired in April of 2008. So he no longer has the license to do anything more with it. So there won't be anything more coming out of New Phoenix Filmworks that's Paul Apparel based. Uh, all the production rights are now with Atlanta Studios. But he, I've given him the green light to release. That footage provided, you know, it, it's, it's edited together and it kind of works as its own thing. And I think a lot of people would love to see it. I, yeah, I think absolutely. Valerie did some great work on it. She's, you know, she really developed as an actress working on this, on that. Um, all that work you want it to be seen. You don't want it uh, packed away in a box or on your hard drive or, or whatnot. No, and there, there was a really incredible cast that was all put together for that. Uh, we... The, the the great thing about the Midnight is the Darkest Hour script is that it, we it shows Paula as a little girl, it shows her parents, it shows give you some context for what happened to um, to her and her family when she was young and led her to become who she is now. And uh, you know I don't see anything that we're going to produce right now that's going to going to go as far as what Midnight is the Darkest Hour went, at least not for the moment. Okay. But so it's kind of sad to lose that, but at some point we'll we'll turn around we'll we'll. We'll give. We'll put a little more of that into the story. So. I was actually going to kind of jump in there and say that I'm actually friends with uh, Andy Rodriguez. We've been uh, keeping in touch for a few years now. Um, sure. His company, New Phoenix Filmworks, has actually been uh, sending us films, uh, Fanboy Theater here, oh, and yeah. we've actually been reviewing them for for quite some time now. So it was, you know, very cool for you to uh, mention him. Uh, I always plan to have him on the show one day, so hopefully uh, we can make something happen maybe in the near future. But I just wanted to say, it, you know, I definitely agree. He's got a great direction as a director. He's got a really, you know, unique style. He knows what he's doing, so hopefully one day it'll it'll, it'll all come out work work for you guys. It'll be good to see it mesh. Well, he's like I said, he's a very talented editor, has a great writer. He wrote a great, excellent script. And, I, you know, I know his thing is kind of super heroines and that kind of thing, but... Um, I and Paul Apparel is maybe a change of direction, um, but I thought that he pulled off some really good things. And I, if you do get him on the phone and do a podcast or, or talk with him, I'd say uh, that maybe you should ask him about uh, the status of the Paul Apparel footage because uh, you know I'd like to, I'd like to see it out. There's nothing for me to gain from it other than right. It's great to see the character come alive. Yeah. I know I do know how hard Valerie and others worked on it as well. So yeah, that's the that's the shame. Yep. the real shame. Shut that up, Will. <laughs> Andy Rodriguez. Uh, so what do you got there, Will? Anything? Um, Get it I out, boy. As kind of like as a closer, uh, was there any uh, ideas or plans to maybe uh, pursue an animated series at all? I think I think Paula would be great as an animated series. Yeah, I can see that translating really well. That's why like I got a flash, you know, kind yeah. of a flash animation or something like that would be cool. Yeah, especially when you see some of the great action, you know, series that are on right now. You know, everything from the Batman to Justice League to other things like that to uh, even the Wonder Woman uh, DVD that just came out. I mean, right. there's done well. Uh, I, I even look at things like Kim Possible and other comics that you know Disney cartoons that Disney has done, and I think this kind of action heroine 
you know, uh, amped up Nancy Drew type of mystery uh, solver would uh, really work well um, in in cartoons. And of course, my, you know, I drew cartoons when I was right when I was 18. You know, just out of high school, I was working in an animation studio drawing layouts. So uh, absolutely, I, I could see it. I could see it happen. Um, we're actually taking steps toward creating a uh, style guide for an animated Paula. Um, and uh, I can't talk too much about that other than just say that uh, I, I think that will be the first step, and kind of just create that style guide and then maybe present it to some producers and say, uh, you know, if we, can we get a budget for 13 episodes and a place, to, a place that wants to buy them, you know? But that's, I think the live-action films are where we're at now. Uh, if we can successfully pull off the next two movies along with Crystal Falcon and, and kind of improve our process, and uh, then we'll be in a good good spot. It's a lot of money to produce an animated cartoon. Um, it's uh, uh, really to create some, some live action films, short live action films, obviously on video, much less than a, an animated cartoon. It could be about $100,000 an episode or so. So it's um, a little bit of a bigger decision and certainly not one that little Atlanta studios could make <laughs> by itself. But uh, I, that's why I'm saying if we create the style guide and we have a look and feel and a proposal and maybe a pilot episode, screenplay written, then that's something we can actually take into a meeting and say, hey, here's, here she is. Here's how she'd look. What do you think? So uh, we'll see. Maybe a year from now we'll be talking more about that. As far as pursuing for film, TV, um, are you going to kind of sit back at this point and wait for these films to come out? Or are you actively pursuing producers, uh, production companies, so on? And showing them these films. Well, interesting that you mentioned that. Um, you know, Midnight is the Darkest Hour, we actually did have a distribution agreement with um, for international distribution of the feature film. So we had representation. We had uh, signed agreements in place with several distributors to distribute the film. Um, another reason that it's so sad, it was never, <laughs> never refinished because it had an immediate market and um, immediate buyers for the feature film. Uh, I think one of the great things about a feature film, and so why, you know, why people decide to go make a feature, is because there are people who will buy them. There's international markets, there's national markets, there's cable, there's direct to DVD. There's a lot of places that that want a really good feature. the The key thing is uh, the key thing is kind of control. How much control does Atlanta Studios do we want over you know this character? I mean, you could make you could make something extremely exploitive from this character. You could make something extremely tepid, really boring. Uh, so the, the point is to try and make something that would be really, really good, people would want to see. Uh, it doesn't have to be a big, huge budget movie. Um, it needs to be something that uh, could be could be shot at a good independent budget and that could be, uh, you know, that'd be worth it. They're worth, uh, you know, worth people seeing. So people aren't knocking at my door saying, uh, we'd really like to make the next Iron Man out of Paul Apparel. Right. But, um, but I, I would say that... Um, I think if we can show, if, if, if the fans really respond and they see these three live-action movies and they, and they love them and, and, and we can show that they, there's a good audience for this, this kind of fun character, then, then we, can go to, we can go to distributors and say, listen, we've got, a, we've got a feature film screenplay. And we can say, hey, this is what we'd like to produce and, and here's our budget. And I think we may have some takers. Um, I, I will say that uh, we, we, do have a, we do have a feature film. We do have a screenplay. Not Midnight is the Darkest Hour, something that okay. Atlanta Studios would own. Uh, we do have that sitting in the file cabinet, and <laughs> we think we know what we'd want to do. Um, the question is, uh, you know, it's not something we could probably finance on our own, at least, at least if it's going to be really, really good. You know, we'd need partners to, to come in, like most, you know, like most right. can't and do it on their own. Hopefully it won't go into, like, the development hell like a lot of movies <laughs> go into if that opportunity arises. Which is yeah, which is one of the things I'm I'm uh, I'm not a big fan of that. I think if Atlanta Studios, we own the rights to this character, we have a, a clear vision of where we want to take her, then we ought to take her there and uh, find find partners who want to go that the direction we want to go in. Um, there's plenty of people who want to buy up your idea and put it in development for two years time, right. and then come out with their own version. Yeah, <laughs> they you know they steal it or some other studios. Yeah. My tendency, I mean, this is this will be a real pivotal year if people love Paul Apparel and they love because this because Crystal Falcon is as close to the comic as we can get, probably on our budget. It's a good gives you a good sense of the kind of stories that happen in the comic. If we can reproduce 
in the next couple films that, that look and feel of what happens in the comic on film and people respond to it and like it and want more, then, uh, you know, the next step will be a feature. And we'll, we'll look for funding for a feature. And, uh, and, and my preference would be to film it here in the Atlanta area not, uh, and not anywhere else. Okay, so that's excellent. Here. We have a lot of talent here. I know you guys are up in, you're both up in New York, is that right? Yeah, I know Atlanta's got tons of freaking cable stations down there, so you're in the right area. We do. I mean, we're just down the street from Time Warner and Turner and all those people, and we've got a lot of animation people. We've got a lot of film uh, production going on here, and um, uh, there's there's no question we could do it all here. So yeah. I think that would be, if we, if we do move forward with a feature, uh, probably will be uh, Atlantis owned or co-financed film and it will be filmed here in Atlanta. Probably cheaper to make it there too. Yeah, yeah. And beyond so beyond that I don't I don't know and like I said, we just need to sit back and make sure there's a that people want to see it. But uh, I'd love to have response. I want people to give us feedback on Crystal Falcon. I want them to rush out and order it and buy some comics and, and then tell us what they think and what they'd like to see. Uh, we had a lot of emails from people over the past few months with story ideas and things people want to see in the character and and uh, that's it's kind of fun because we're at the comic book studio, but we're also we can have we can put some of that stuff in the movies too if we want. So it's uh, I hope people will listen to your podcast and go to your website to give us some good feedback. Absolutely, yeah, it looks good. And I think you're the first person we talked to who actually made a fan film out of their own comic book. There you go. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> probably your first. Right. I just want to put my hat off to uh, to the director of Crystal Falcon, Savi Loristani. Um, he is a young, very talented up-and-coming director here in the Atlanta area. He's, uh, he's got a new feature film out, The 16th Summer. But uh, what I saw, I mean, we, we, we were in production for about two and a half months on Crystal Falcon on a variety of scenes and circumstances, and he's incredibly talented at working with actors and uh, the, um, you know, the, the production designers and the film, the film uh, cinematographers and got some incredible things. Like, like I said, always say this, given, given the budget, we all had to work with. I was extremely pleased with um, with what he was able to pull out of all the talent, many of whom, you know, really just worked, donated their time, volunteered on this film, and and I hope that what we what we do with the Paul Apparel films that will set it apart from other stuff that's out there is that we really are going for trying to make these characters come alive. You know, uh, the one thing I told Savvy when we first talked about the director when we first started talking about this project is I said, listen, the one thing I don't want this to do is I don't want to go cheesecake. I don't want to go, um, you know, I don't, also don't want to go to TV. Uh, <laughs> you know, we're not trying to do the Batman TV series. Okay? We're, uh, everyone involved has got to recreate this world of the comic with a straight face. Think more like Buffy the Vampire Slayer or Smallville or that kind of thing. That's what we're trying to do. And I hope what it set us apart is there's, you know, there's a lot of fun reasons to watch these films, a lot of eye candy, but at the same time, uh, what you can do with a film that you can't do with a comic is you can make these characters real. You know, uh, when they cut, when they're cut, they bleed. When they, when they, when they hurt, you can see that emotion on their face. When, uh, you know, when there's danger and peril, you can create emotions on film that you you can try to do it in the comic, but film is so much different. And you, these are real actors, and you know, Marla. Uh, who plays Veronica in the film. I mean, she's been in several films, 2001 Maniacs, Blood Car, other films. But in this one, it was really the first time she was able to really recreate create the character. I thought she did a great job. Um, uh, I think Valerie stepped up. I think some of the other actors, you know, it, hopefully um, that's one thing we'll do in these films is we will, we're really trying to create flesh and blood characters, hopefully a little bit more than two dimensions. Try for good, solid three dimension Um through the characters and and there's some suggestions of backstory there's uh you know there's some things we're gonna you're gonna see some things in the next two movies that are only suggested in the first movie that i think will be a lot of fun for people to go back and realize we're really you know trying to create a continuity here with that with that so we're i'm just throwing that out i think everybody who worked on this was incredibly talented i can't name all the names because i'll forget everybody but <laughs> i do want to my hat is off to savvy Lorstani, the director who really took this concept, brought an incredibly talented group of people together, and just uh, really made it come alive, made it real. And I think uh, uh, we had, you know, even even the act extras, we had a ton of extras for the, sh the scene in the gallery who came and spent, you know, 16-hour days sitting around in tuxedos. In some ways, this of the three films, this was the most difficult because uh, of things like that. How do you manage, you know, these extras and the lighting and the things like that. So the... Um, 
Yeah, a lot of people really were dedicated. A lot of you know, we, the people who came to be extras, you know, found us, you know, through the MySpace page, the Paul Apparel MySpace page, and uh, we put out a notice. And you know, a lot of people who are, who are in the film are fans of the comic or fans of the series. Um, anyway, simply to say that I hope I hope people enjoy the stories. They're going to be action packed. There's going to be uh, peril and danger and you know, impossibly beautiful women. But at the same time. Um, Hopefully the characters will really come alive, too, and people have fun with it on another level as well. So, but one of the things that I saw was how many people were willing to give so much. For example, we, we needed some beautiful evening dresses for, our, for Valerie and for Marla. And we'll let you borrow his. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I tell you. No cost to us. Of course, it didn't quite fit, Valerie. But um, My pleasure. <laughs> But um, we, we were able to go to a local business uh, who's, you know, one of the best uh, evening gown places in Atlanta and said, listen, we're doing this film. We don't have any money. Uh, we just really need some beautiful dresses and jewelry for, you know, this opening scene. They read the script. They saw the comics. And they said, yeah, absolutely. We, uh, we want to do it. And they donated over $1,000 in, in dresses and jewelry for the opening scene for for Marla and Valerie, and uh, really made that, that scene work. There were the other people donated. The, the locations uh, were donated. Um, Colin Wald uh, Fine Arts Center, which is the mansion that you see in the film. Um, yeah, I saw it in the trailer, yeah. Or yeah, a little bit of it in the trailer. Yeah, and then the, the gallery, uh, the opening scene, that was actually an art gallery in downtown Atlanta. They, you know, we took over their, their gallery for three or four days while we filmed that. So all that was just donated. And... Um, it's it's incredible, and there'll be a lot of that we'll be asking for in the next movie too. So, um, but I, I was just uh, amazed. You can have a really good property and a really good story. Um, you know, people come forward and they, like you say, they want to see you do some great things with you know just a little budget, and uh, you know some miracles happen to make it happen. So, um, well, one other thing I'm just going to throw out there. You know, some of the things the people who see the movie ought to look for is, you know, there are some. Uh, You'll see throughout the movie that there are various newspaper headlines, and uh, especially in the Gazette scene, kind of in the middle of the movie, there's uh, uh, in Paula's office, uh, you're going to see uh, various newspaper headlines and um, photos. And if, if they, you can't see them on screen for very long, but uh, some of those are clues to what's happening, going to happen in the next movie. Oh, okay. And some of them are clues to things that happen in the comics. So you actually see mm -hmm. in that scene. Uh, newspaper headlines, of art, you know, stories from you know the comics. Uh, you also see, if you look really, <laughs> really carefully, there's actually some copies of the Paula Apparel comic kind of sitting on the desk. Oh, the cool. <laughs> so you get this sense that you know Paula's reading her own comic, you know, even while she's you know reporting on the story. So um, this is fun stuff to look around. There's uh, the art direction, the production design. We were really careful about putting some things in there that will be. Uh, drawn out a little bit more in the next story. So. All right. Is there anything else you wanted to uh, promote? Maybe give us your website? Uh, yeah, please. Um, for information on the movie, go to atlantastudios.net forward slash Paula Farrell. Um, I encourage anyone who's a fan of the series or wants to just kind of keep in the loop on what's going on with the comics and the next film to join Paula's MySpace page, which is myspace.com forward slash Paula Farrell. And that's really where we post uh, a lot of the updates um, on what's going on, both in comics and in film. And there's a lot of exclusive photos you'll only find there on the MySpace page. So, okay, very good. All right, anything else there, William? I'm done, sir. And uh, uh, you know, I got to say, it was a pl pleasure meeting you finally. You know, speaking to yeah. you at least. Well, thanks for what you're doing. Like I said, I love your I love your website. Absolutely. Yeah. I learn thanks, a lot every time. I, every time I go to them, I, I learn something new about what people are doing out there in movies. It's amazing. Good. Fantastic. We love what, what you do and all this. You film. keep up the good work on your end. Some creators, awesome. correct. We'll keep putting Paula in danger. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so I make the dollars. <laughs> exactly. Hey, thanks, guys. Hey, James. Take, Take care, now. <laughs>